Fox told me, Barry, when they yell, and when they get shrill, when they scream, when they scratch, when they complain, they don't mean a thing. When they start throwing stuff, you watch. He was talking about women. Uh, he said, when they throw ordinary stuff, doesn't mean a thing. When they start throwing expensive stuff, you know, the good crystal, then you better watch out because you got a problem. Uh, the space age began to impress me when Thomas Wolfe began to become available for talk shows uh, because of it. Uh, Tom Wolfe uh, never did come to talk shows until the space age got dire. Forgive me, I'm not a NASA scientist. I'm a humanist. Uh, and when Tom Wolfe is here on time uh, for a show that's going to do nothing but talk uh, about space, uh, then I believe that the space age has finally arrived. James E. Oberg got to jump on me in the Carter. He recognized me before I recognized him, but that doesn't mean that he is not total. James Oberg, O-B-E-R-G, is a computer analyst, worked on the space shuttle, NASA mission, mission control in Houston. He lectures to not just people, but to astronauts about the Soviet space effort. He was a distinguished lecturer at the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. He has twice been awarded the Robert Goddard Memorial History Prize for his Soviet-related research. Dr. Robert Jastro has the name Goddard and his credential, too. He's been here a hundred times. He's the author of The Enchanted Loom, about inner space this time, the human brain. He's the head of the Goddard Space Flight Center in New York City. I was able to give you the assignment of commenting on that Eisenhower administration official who said, quote, don't worry, they'll never drop anything on you from a Sputnik. Uh, where have we gone since then? Well, um, I remember that comment. I think it may have been Eisenhower himself. I'm not certain. It was kind of tacky. It may have been Charles Wilson. Uh, I don't think it was Eisenhower. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Um, that was very bad, uh, very bad guess, I would say, on their part, because actually the world rocked on its ear. And uh, when we tried to get up the uh, Vanguard 1, you may remember it rose four feet off the pad and collapsed in a sea of fire, and newspapers all over the world said Flopnik and Kaputnik. I was in the Vanguard Control Center that, that uh, day, and I, I mean, uh, Jim will want to say something about this, I'm sure, but, but uh, the Russians are not good engineers and they can't make anything work well. And as soon as we put our mind to it, we just left them in the dust. And then after uh, uh, 69 and the moon landing, we turned our minds to other things. And the Russians kept plugging away because they don't have a democratic government. And the fact they can't feed bread to their people doesn't prevent the government from continuing to spend about three times as much in space as we do. So they uh, forged ahead while we uh, forgot about the whole man in space program for eight years. And then we launched the shuttle, and we left him in the dust again. Engineer, that we are uh, the, the hare in the tortoise and the hare. You remember that marvelous fable, the hare, who was much fleeter of foot, kept going over to the side of the road and sleeping. And the tortoise went ka-thump, ka-thump, boogada, 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 boogada down the road and eventually caught up with the hare. Well, twice now, we have, like the hare, surpassed and superseded. <laughs> and won, and gone over to the side of the road and flaked out and gone to sleep, and that old Soviet tortoise come boom, boom, boom down the road and has caught up with us now twice. You're right, 15% of the people interviewed by the night newspaper chain in 1970 in the summer, exactly one year after the moonwalk, did not believe there had ever been such a thing. They figure national morale was low and Nixon is, was a conniver and uh, they, they did the whole thing in some Air Force hangar in Dayton, Ohio to improve morale. It was I, I, like I, I cheated. Yeah. Yeah. How about the Russians, however? They were making it a military arena. And all during the Carter administration, there was very little reaction to the situation. Uh, now in the new administration, we've doubled our spending, military spending in space to meet a threat, which is very real because it involves being able to blind a reconnaissance satellite with laser weapons uh, just over the horizon under circumstances that make it impossible to pin the wrap on the Russians. Uh, with a thousand pieces of iron floating around up there, 
how can we prove that they actually knock one of our, our, our eyes in the sky out? And when that happens, it's very destabilizing for world peace because we can't tell anymore where they're moving their missiles. It's a very bad situation, and it's one we must respond to, and we are beginning to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm, get, uh, I'm not involved in military matters except for what I read in Aviation Week, which is where everybody else gets his classified information. But uh, I have the impression the particle beams that uh, uh, General Keegan was interested in are not so important as laser weapons because it's hard to get these particle beams through the atmosphere without getting scattered. But the laser weapons may, and all that Buck Rogers stuff, that may be real and uh, really important. And uh, blinding our reconnaissance satellites is a, a real threat. Didn't the weapon recently and fail? No, it was testing of an airborne laser device and uh, uh, apparently, because of publicity, this happened in, over California. I, I know some people involved. In fact, when I was in the Air Force about 10 years ago, I was involved with initial planning for that vehicle, and uh, there was a, it did not the missile was not destroyed, and I guess we call it a failure. But right now, they're still, still trying to ch check the tracking of the vehicle, and to have a, a laser of that power fire from an airborne platform in itself is a major advance. So uh, uh, it, it's a device. To, I'm not trying to be quibble over words, but it, it's hardly a weapon system. It's a, it's a test. To, it could lead to a weapon system. Well, uh, and bombers. The, the Russians did test a killer satellite twice, and once it worked. And that's another very dangerous development. And it's interesting that they did it. You know, we have not been interested in this as a military arena, except for reconnaissance satellites. Ten, ten, years, ten years ago, they tested a carrier in orbit for thermonuclear bombs. And yeah, clear violation of the, of the Outer Space Treaty. They were testing I mean that while they were Yeah, FOBS. Yeah, they, they're really, uh, you know, uh, uh, a very bad bunch in this respect. And they, uh, they're bad players and they behave badly. And uh, my academic friends who think that everything is good over there and uh, hmm. it's only uh, the American conservatives that are bad really are um, uh, blind. But are we really paying attention to this? Or even are we paying enough attention to this? Attention. We're paying attention, but it's hard to see through the smoke screen, and that's one thing that I've had a lot of fun with as a, as a space sleuth, trying to figure out what the Russians are up to. Yeah. Look through the smoke screen. Isn't it true, though, that it still is very difficult to, to fire a missile from space and hit something on Earth? Missiles from space hit something on Earth, I think, is still militarily yeah. doesn't make much sense, because it's two it it days before you get over the spot you're interested in. Hold it. Hold Tom Wolfe is with us. Uh, I wish I'd thought of that line first. I easily could have. He just simply beat me to it because he's Tom Wolf. I saw him in a normal tuxedo, black suit, uh, and a white shirt and a reception line in the Hotel Plaza, probably the best address in the whole USA party for William F. Buckley, Jr. Tom Wolf has been frequently admired by William F. Buckley and apparently on many occasions returns the favor for standing in that reception line. And I looked at him and I blinked. My eyeballs bulged and dangled by the optic nerve. Something was clearly wrong. Tom Wolf doesn't wear black suits and white shirts. He wears white suits. And I blank. I said, Tom, I didn't recognize him. Tom looked at me and smiled sheepishly and said, yes, I'm negative tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I got put out of business, uh, Barry, in the White Suit League. By, first by um, Robert Redford in The Great Gatsby which was Great Gatsby as reinterpreted by the garment industry and uh, Redford wore a white suit all the way through that movie. Then what really finished me off was John Travolta in <laughs> Saturday Night Fever. And after that, you saw a white suit coming out of every, uh, every disco boutique on the backs of the uh, gold chains and the chest hair set. And uh, I figured it was time to throw in the towel. Now, making potential, I think you have an analogy with the Maginot line here. Uh, the French rested assured uh, that whatever the Germans were capable of, it was okay, because they had a big, thick line between France and Germany. The idea of the Germans coming through Belgium simply never occurred to anybody. It was as breathtaking as some joke of that era where an American detective said, uh, uh, be sure and cover all the exits. We know that bad guy is in that theater. And they missed him. And one of the cops said, gee, we covered all the exits. Exits. That guy must have come out one of the entrances. Uh, now the Germans came in one uh, in one of the exits, uh, Belgium. Uh, here the Soviets are, are doing war 
like things in outer space, and it doesn't even make page one. I mean, Dr. Robert Jastrow has to put it all together and come on a radio show of this nature uh, to make a clenched fist uh, out of the whole thing. The Times did report, that in addition to Aviation Week, the Times is also my source. They reported that killer satellite test, uh, I think it was last summer, if I'm not mistaken. The latest test was, in fact, just this March and April. It's also the time they resumed test flights of this nuclear power satellite, the kind they dropped on Canada and promised they wouldn't do no more. And they've been testing those again, too. But what's most disturbing about these uh, military developments is that the device the Russians have is one that we are not even going to build. It's a space-to-space it's a -space military system. We're now working on a surface-to-space system to be launched actually for an aircraft to intercept satellites. But the Soviet system, which, which is space-to-space, -space, has much more range and is quite disturbing when you try and figure out what might it be that they're interested in attacking. Of the 85 space launches, we had 13, and of their 85, 63 were for military purposes, including almost 50 spy satellites. And only of the 85, only three were scientific. And uh, there right, was well, nine related why stuff. It's almost, it's a topic, though, that lends itself to public uh, misunderstanding because of, of comments like dropping bombs from orbit. Uh, if uh, Charlie Wilson said in 1957 that no one will ever drop a bomb from a Sputnik, uh, he, he, he guessed right. That he, was, he was right and he was, it was lucky. It was a lucky hit because you really can't drop a bomb from a Sputnik. If you drop the bomb, it would stay with you and follow you. In fact, if I hit you again half an hour later, if you tried to fire a rocket down from a satellite, you could get it back to Earth because we bring our astronauts back by, by firing rockets. But aiming a rocket at a point on Earth from space may take days before it reaches the point you want because of navigation uh, 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 complexity in, in Earth orbit. So the idea of putting bombs in Earth orbit uh, doesn't really make much military sense. It's, uh, they're safer and more, and more easily targeted from holes in the ground or, or from submarines. Poor and all this stuff. Yeah. They do have a lot of military muscle, and it seems to be all they care about. Well, they the shuttle, on the other hand, is not military at all. 26% of its payload is military. Mm -hmm. You never know this from the media. I must say the media are always... Uh, well, well, there's an awful lot of 26, you know, and it's in fact, fact less than we're doing now with expendable boosters. The Soviets have unleashed a real vicious and hypocritical campaign against the shuttle, claiming it's the Pentagon's new space fleet, and they're doing it with a typical... Uh, typical pattern, a mixture of, of misquotations and, and, and fabrications and then exaggerations. Uh, saying that Aided and abetted by some of our media they quote some people. They quote Science Magazine, they quote New Scientist, uh, they quote other spokesmen who, who have all kinds of anxieties about what we, what we might do with the shuttle. The, thing, the worst things we might do with the shuttle, the Soviets are already doing with expendable boosters. Well, if the Soviets are as inept as the two of you are saying, do we have anything to worry about? Inept is, uh, I would like to see a T-54 tank when I mean, knowing it was built with 20-year-old technology. <laughs> it still can fire a pretty hefty projectile at you, and they may not be able to get to Venus, or I get to Venus fine, they may not be able to get to Jupiter, but they can, uh, their military technology is, is not bad. In the last eight years when, years, when we did nothing in manned space, they kept on uh, pushing, and uh, they finally overtook us. There, uh, at the time of the Apollo Soyuz mission, uh, one of the, our uh, American team on that mission told me that they they were really uh, horrified or amused, whatever, by the uh, by the state of the Russian technology and uh, when they uh, you know exchanged visits between the two capsules. And at that time, they were uh, in a very crude state compared to our uh, space uh, technology. But in eight years, they caught up and they passed us. And now again, we passed them, of course. I had tried so hard to get on the moon, though, in 1968, 1969, and then pretended they weren't trying at all. Right down to the last month before Absolutely. we fired Apollo uh, 11, they tried to put a little robot thing on so they could ace us in the world press, and they even failed there. Yeah, that was a Jasper point, a very important point here, that the Russians, after losing the moon race, finessed us by claiming they never had been in the race and, and, total, and in a very large degree uh, took away the political significance of our victory in the moon race by saying, well, it wasn't really a race. We didn't really intend to be in there. Well, that's baloney. They're lying. They wanted to get there. We beat them. Now, this is a well-known and well-documented fact. And, in, and in, it's in, so in interesting that the American that. academic establishment and the uh, press and media are uh, so keen to see bad here and good there that they have accepted this uh, myth and swallowed it whole. Wow, you know, I, whoa. 
who was always in outer space in many ways, but this time uh, under his real name, author of The Right Stuff. The Right Stuff. Tom, uh, pretend that I'm your publisher and you haven't submitted a manuscript yet and you tell me what The Right Stuff is about. The Right Stuff is about the competition among pilots that preceded the, the Mercury program, the first program that NASA uh, had in space and, uh, and went on during. It's really, it's, it's really a book that has more about the psychology of the pilot than about... Uh, Mercury was way back at the beginning. That was before Gemini and before Apollo. That's right. It was the very first that uh, it began. Well, the men were selected in 1959, and it ran, it ran for four years, and finally it began. The, the program finally got off the, the ground with Alan Shepard's flight. Uh, the suborbital sub lob, flight, which uh, yeah. did not impress the world a great deal because it came after Yuri Gagarin's, very shortly after Yuri Gagarin's orbital flight for the Soviets. I'm trying to remember which astronaut it was who was reprimanded officially for sneaking a corned beef sandwich on board. Oops, that's why our latest guy who's in yeah. Columbia, uh -huh. our John Young, our the uh, veteran pilot who you saw bounce up and down at Edwards Air Force Base when the Columbia came back from space. He's 50 years old, still on duty, <laughs> and in fact, one of the, still one of the Cracker Jack uh, old jet test pilots that we have in the program. As a matter of fact, that flap over the corned beef sandwich uh, had a kind of uh, unrevealed script to it. Uh, they, they made such a point of it when he took this sandwich into, into uh, Gemini 3 uh, because a lot of the engineers at NASA were getting sick and tired of the power of the astronaut. Now, the astronaut went into the program as a guinea pig, really. Uh, somebody who wasn't even a pilot. A monkey, I guess. A monkey, right. He was like, well, it, it, uh, the, the old test pilots like Chuck Yeager used to say a monkey is going to make the first flight, and a monkey didn't. A chimpanzee made the first flight in the Mercury program. Then Alan Shepard went up, and then another chimpanzee went into Earth orbit, and then John Glenn went up. So the, the astronaut really did very little in Mercury. And so, the, but the astronaut was a was a great American uh, hero, and perhaps the last national heroes we've ever had with a Mercury uh, uh, astronaut. So to try to cut, uh, they really wanted the, a lot of people at NASA wanted to cut the power of the astronaut down a bit. And so, when against all uh, regulations, Young took up this corned beef sandwich, which was actually a rather harmless thing. All in all, uh, they did make a point of it, and it uh, he was penalized to a certain extent. Also, Gemini 3 was the last time they had let an astronaut name a ship. Gus Grissom named his Gemini uh, spacecraft the unsinkable Molly Brown. It was his first spacecraft. Uh, the Liberty Bell had, had sunk and in, the, in the Atlantic Ocean. It was lost. And after that, they said, no more of this you know, sort of personality cult of the spacecraft. Uh, and they just had numbers from that Gemini 4, Gemini 5, and uh, uh, and so on. That's how far back John Young goes, incidentally. But you're not one-fourth, well, no, maybe not an eighth. Well, there was actually a little... Uh, in, when Neil Armstrong did his first commercial, he did it for the American Banking Association. He's better known for the ones he did for Chrysler uh, more recently. He did it for the American Banking Association, and uh, with him in this series of commercials was Scott Carpenter, who was the second American to go into Earth orbit. And Byron Nelson, the golfer, who had re retired 20 years before. It was very dignified commercials in which the uh, which Armstrong merely said that he believed in free enterprise and that he knew the banking system was a part of the grapes of the country and so on. Well, they had a follow-up survey to see the impact of these um, commercials. And, and just as you indicate, it, an extremely high proportion, uh, almost 50% of those who did not know who this man was, Neil uh, Armstrong, only about 35% knew who Scott Carpenter was, but about 75% knew who Byron Nelson was. Oh, come And on. he had retired 20 years before. That, that Soviet uh, dissident poet, Yevtushenko, his detractors at the time said he was a potted plant, he was a house dissident, he was a ruse. 
he was a cat's paw, uh, he was a pawn, he was a patsy, and I kind of believe that because if he weren't, we'd have still been hearing about him. In other words, the Soviets cleverly said, hey, the West wants a dissident, we will nominate a dissident and give him dispensation to dissent. Anyhow, I had him on my radio show in New York City, and uh, he was a little bit late, but the switchboard girl called me out and said, there's somebody out here uh, who is supposed to meet your guest. And I went out there, and it was a short fellow. And I said, how you doing, Barry Farber? Can I help you? He said, I'm Mr. Armstrong, and I'm waiting for Mr. Yevtushenko. And I figured, gee whiz, the State Department uh, is sending chaperones, and that's fine. There are people named Armstrong who speak Russian, who went to Monterey language school. I said, Mr. Armstrong, would you come into the studio? Uh, I made him comfortable. I even offered him coffee. I didn't talk much to him. He didn't talk much to me. He sat there patiently and waited for Yevgeny Yevtushenko, who was yet to come. Well, Yevtushenko came, and he was like an unmade bed. You know, he really looked the part of a dissident poet from some Slavic country, gangly, all hands and glands, you know. Uh, uh, and, and then he came down the hall and went into the studio. And I was talking to him and telling him about the show, and uh, we were going to be on for 45 minutes, and I was going to ask him anything I pleased, and this was a free country, and I hope he didn't mind embarrassing questions about the Soviet Union and every kind of... All of a sudden, he looked at this man who I thought was a State Department interpreter chaperone, Mr. Armstrong, and he lit up, and he said, Neil, and he ran over and embraced Mr. Armstrong. That was Neil Armstrong, that guy who I thought was an unspectacular State Department chaperone interpreter, <laughs> turned out to be the first man in history to walk on the moon. I said, Mr. Armstrong, gee, I'm sorry. I, you got to forgive me. I did not recognize that. I just wasn't expecting you. It was like meeting somebody in Asia. I mean, here, you know, Mr. Armstrong, I, I, I didn't know. Forgive me. Would you mind let me pull up a chair and another microphone and, and have you join us in these proceedings? He said, oh, no, no, no. I'm just a friend of Yevgeny, and we're going to have a bite afterward. I, I'll just sit here in the corner. I said, well, may I? May I uh, uh, allude to the fact that you are present? He said, oh, no, no, I really wish you wouldn't. Uh, uh, it's, it's Yevgeny's day, and uh, I'll just say, can you imagine sitting there doing a, an interview with Yevgeny Yevtushenko with Neil Arms? I mean, can you imagine sitting there? And if, what, if, what if they'd had radio back in the 1400s? Can you imagine interviewing some mud scow pilot off the coast of Italy when Christopher Columbus is sitting in the corner of the, <laughs> of the same studio <laughs> and you're not mentioning anything and you're not noticing. Uh, we have ourselves. Is there anybody else who is a serious contender in space? Oh, yes. Uh, the Europeans are so anxious to get a piece of this action that they have built a rocket called Ariane, which is trying to steal our space shuttle business away. Wait, 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 wait. And they were just delighted when we fell behind in the shuttle. But then to their chagrin, they had a bad launch a while ago, and they fell behind. But they're still in there trying to underbid us. It's straight uh, economics and uh, dollar return on a magnificent R&D program. It has nothing to do at all, really, with science or with other matters. Wait, wait, wait. That's all icing on the cake. What kind of action? Uh, I mean, where is the payoff? And the payoff is in uh, launching. What they're looking for is a piece of the launch business because uh, communication satellites and Earth resource satellites that can tell you from, uh, from 600 miles up in the sky what kind of crops are growing on the ground and where the mineral wealth is and maybe even where there oil, there's oil. Uh, these are tremendously valuable applications to businessmen everywhere. And uh, to get those, uh, those uh, economic satellites up in the sky is itself a big business which NASA has been undertaking as a service, but the Europeans are trying to get in underneath and, and cut us out. And the Japanese are also planning a big space program. They've got a pretty good one uh, going already. The only ones who don't seem to care about anything, you know, that uh, betters the lot of the man in the street by raising his living standard are the Russians. They only want to do military stuff in space. But the rest of the world is all economics and uh, business-minded in this area. There's even some private groups organizing to try and build uh, expendable cheap launch vehicles. There's a group in, uh, in Germany, the Orbital Transport Group, which has been under suspicion over the years of being a front for somebody or a tax dodge, but they're a private group of rocket engineers who say they can launch rockets. Unfortunately, they got involved in a civil war in Zaire a few years ago, 
and have tried to pick a safer place to test rockets for a strip of desert south of a place called Tripoli. Unfortunately, also, it's within Libya. And so they are right now, they're extras, I guess, in the movie on Libya, but they're now <laughs> part of a controversy. The Israelis accused them of actually building military missiles for Gaddafi, and they may well have promised Gaddafi missiles, but they apparently are trying to develop a commercial satellite launch uh, vehicle in competition with Ariane and the shuttle. Where are anyway, Ariane uh, launch from? Uh, it's uh, uh, Kourou, French Guinea, Guinea or something. Yeah, I don't yeah. know what it's present. Right off the Devil's Island. Yeah. And but they're ready to go in a few weeks, the next, the third shot. It's very important. Right. If it doesn't work, they're probably finished. Well, anyway, I, when I was in Japan, I suggested the Japanese ought to get going on a shuttle. It would be smaller and cheaper and burn less gas, and it would really give us some competition. It, that brings up the whole question of military activities in that region of space, because when you're 20,000 miles out, that's beyond the range of Earth radar. You can't track things by radar, so there are cameras being developed to photograph objects that far out. Things can go on out in, the, in that very important area of space where all these communication satellites are strung along that we as yet don't have complete control over or even uh, monitoring capability. And so it's a... Anyway, it's, well, it's very simple. We spent $22 billion on the Apollo program. For that, we got the American semiconductor and computing industry because that miniaturization, which is now the only thing we have in the whole world that anybody else wants to buy, we've even lost a share of the airplane market. A share of the world's commercial airplane market is down from 75% to 46% as of this year. So there's nothing we make that anybody wants to buy anymore except the things that we develop with the aid of NASA's money and some DOD money. And they pay more in taxes every year than we spend in the whole program. This kind of R&D is the basis of a... Let me tell you a story about Intel. Intel. R&D is research and development. Yes, I'm sorry to lapse into that jargon. But this kind of high-class engineering which is almost research, produces the product, uh, creates the productivity that is the wealth of this country. So Berg has left the room. He's calling Sweden. Something monumental is happening in space, and who knows, we may get an American scoop on it uh, before we part company. Probably now, like, in the same position that Columbus was uh, after his fourth voyage to the New World. Columbus made four voyages to America. We made six to the moon. And at the conclusion of this series of voyages, neither can get any more money from anybody. <laughs> we're, we're tired of this. There's nothing coming back. That's why we don't know our Spanish names today. Mm -hmm. You told us that you're going to bring us gold back from the New World, and you brought us balls of cotton. That's about all he could bring back. Uh, and they were overset on cotton anyway uh, in, in Europe. And, and then Columbus died not in, not in obscurity exactly, but he was by far from being a... a um, um, widely honored person upon the time of his death. And, and they got to the point before the shuttle, in fact, it's in the way true now, that NASA could hardly keep the lights on down in Houston. That was about the size of their... It's hard to the target. Right now, we've got uh, four out of five of the ceiling lights are, are turned off <laughs> for electricity. And you know, I, to me, the, the, the real selling point of space program cannot be sold, and that is... It, what it's really all about, in my estimation, is the exploration of the rest of the universe. We haven't arrived at that moment in which, for the first time in the history of man, this is possible. But we can't, no one can sell this idea, and NASA only had one philosopher at the outset, and nobody was in a really mood to listen to philosophy from him. That was Werner von Braun. And NASA didn't need philosophers at the outset, because you only had... Everyone was going to give money to the space program because of the threat of the Russians. Again, I'm beating out my history. I never thought of Werner von Braun as a philosopher. Uh, I thought of Werner von Braun more or less grudgingly as somebody who worked enthusiastically for Adolf Hitler, and uh, we were lucky to get him, and then he went to Alabama and worked. See, to me, Alabama is the best denazification program in the world. <laughs> yeah. 72 hours in Alabama is going to cure every one of them. Uh, there's going to be no vestige remaining. But I, but I figured he was one of them, along with General Dornberger, uh, the, who, I don't know what you mean, Tom, because if Tom Wolfe, who is a philosopher, says Werner von Braun is a philosopher, to me that's innocence by association. <laughs> well, like a lot of rocket uh, enthusiasts, uh, von Braun, like Korolev from Jim described so brilliantly in Red Star in Orbit, the Russian rocket ace, were people who were not, the rocket people were not taken seriously before the Second World War. They simply, they were considered a species of nut. 
And people of that sort had a lot of time to themselves <laughs> to think about things, and they tend to be a little cosmic in their viewpoint. It was Von Brown who said that one day the sun is going to die, and the earth, and if mankind is going to um, continue as a as a species and remain uh, to, and remain alive in the in the in the universe, he's going to have to have a way to escape. And he says we are building an escape route to the stars. Nobody else at NASA was talking along uh, those lines, as so far as I know it, and in those early uh, stages, looking to the long-term implications of space, ex of, of, of space exploration. That's quite a philosophical broad jump from trying to destroy England. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, you didn't mention Well, he would have built rockets for anyone who gave him the money. I mean, he really cared about it very much. old Tom Murray about the song, he's learning Chinese. Yeah, yeah, he was was Jesus, but he was learning Chinese. Hold it. Don't anybody oh. know who Laika was? L-A-I-K-A. I won a uh, intramural college bowl game with that answer, so I'll be a kid. <laughs> oh no, uh, Ohio oh, really? won the uh, college bowl, GE college bowl. Well, this has got to be. Yes, I didn't know that was a real question. I thought I made it up. Who's uh, a uh, Leica? It's, it's a brand of it's a type of dog. Who's a Leica? The guy said, "No, she's a no Leica. She's a have a no choice." <laughs> On that one, <laughs> <laughs> there was a Soviet dog in space, uh, and the name uh, was Laika. When at first there were a dozen dogs followed her, most of them made it back. That's the one they called Mutnik, right? Mm -hmm. well, we're going to learn how to catch up with the Russians and bring our troops uh, back down onto ground instead of the middle of the earth. With the uh, space shuttle, in fact, coming on the runway. Well, the ground is a little bit rough because we use the cushioning of the water in the, in the oceans to uh, lighten the, the weight of the parachutes. And the Soviets had the basic problem that their ships were too heavy. They had tried to ride them in and hit the ground inside the capsules and broken half, their, broken their ribs. So in the first spaceships, they had to bail out. They, it was even worse than ours. They had to eject from the capsule and come down by their own parachute. And that led to one of the interesting little cover-ups. After the first guy got back from space, he had punched out and ejected and came down with a parachute. And his capsule went and made a big hole in the field, in the, in the farm field. And the Russians realized that if they t admitted that he had bailed out of the ship, that would make him ineligible for international flight records because according to the, all the standards in the rule books, you have to take off and land in your vehicle. So rather than face the problem of, of anybody objecting, they just said, oh, he landed in the ship. Rather than face the problem, they just lied about it. And they have to, but then they forgot about it. And a year or two later, they forgot last year's lies and, and told the truth uh, at another news conference. And uh, so the cover, that cover up went away. As new satellites are being launched, they are most hardened. I mean, they can resist the kinds of weapons you expect uh, hostile forces to have. And also, because space is so vast, the satellites can hide. They can be out there without sending signals. And it's so far, they're impossible to find from Earth-based systems. We're speaking not of 100 miles overhead, where you can see them at night, at twilight, uh, at dusk and dawn, satellites crossing the sky, but 20,000 miles in space, where uh, even the giant, most, the greatest telescopes can hardly see them, where they're too far out for radar to, to pick them up. Once I was having to ask Wally, uh, Wally Shira, Bob Jastrow mentioned his name, Wally Shira from Oradell, New Jersey. I was at Oradell. Matter of fact, maybe I should make a big deal and tell you about my involvement in the space age. Uh, when we get back together, uh, I will tell you about the time I welcomed uh, uh, Wally Shira back to Oradell, New Jersey. Uh, that had everything. Uh, it had the high school band and cheerleaders. It was really uh, a hometown thing of the 1920s, uh, adapted to the space age, a uh, little suburban community outside New York City. They wrote a song, when Wally comes marching home again, shira, shira, yeah. I was there that day. Oh, Tom, I don't believe a word of it. You weren't interested in space then. You were space then. I was I was not interested in space, but my boss at the city desk of the New York Herald Tribune said, go to Oradell, New Jersey. I don't believe it. <laughs> really? Yeah. Out there in that big old field, high school. He, he came out of this uh, uh, plane that landed, small plane that uh, landed there, and it, 
and the television interviewer thrust a microphone in his face and said, Wally, tell us what's in your heart. And I could see this mischievous grin. I was, I thought he was going to say, two oracles and two ventricles. You know, he hated those questions. <laughs> but he was pretty good about it. Yeah, he was that kind of guy. I think he later uh, didn't... Wait, who was the astronaut who... Practical joker. Wait, now, who was the astronaut uh, who vetoed some of the television stuff. That was wrong. That was, yeah. Mm -hmm. He he shot it down. uh, Yeah, uh, he said this stuff is not relevant scientifically. He said it's a pain in the upper and lower elbow. Yeah. Right? Didn't he? That that was more astronaut power being exerted. Yeah. And there was, uh, his two crew uh, mates uh, paid for that because they never flew again. Mm. The last gas of it, yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, our eyes and I ask a good question, as an amateur golfer does when he scores a hole in one. And I was one of those sticking microphones into Wally Shiraz's face that day in that high school uh, athletic field in Oradell, New Jersey. And the question I asked him was, what's the smallest thing you can see from orbit? He said, roads. I said, you can see roads? He said, yeah, you can see roads all over the world. Can you imagine seeing roads? <laughs> that was doubted at the time, you know. When, uh, in fact, Gordon Cooper said that he could see smoke coming from a chimney, and that he could see cars on the road, and, so on, and uh, that, and I'm sure they did. Oh, this is my kind of from Pravda here, North American correspondent from Pravda, and I, since it was the first time, I gave him what they call an Indiana State Highway Patrol. Uh, jargon, a, a courtesy ticket. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't hit him too hard. I didn't rough him up too much. I wanted him to come back and bring his friends. And I didn't want to go down as a bad guy or, or, or uh, you know, some in, incontinent anti-communist or something. But I would simply love to euchre uh, the simple admission from a Soviet journalist, yes, Barry, yes, Mr. Farber, you're right. You in the West do report every disaster the minute it occurs totally. And we in the Soviet Union conceal disasters uh, uh, insofar as we are able forever. The only time we admit to disasters are when a significant number of Westerners are lost in that disaster and it is no longer possible to conceal it. Then we grudgingly say, yes, there was a plane crash. But that's all uh, we, we, we give as little as possible, as seldom as possible. And yes, Mr. Farber, you're right. You in the West let the facts emerge uh, as appropriate according to the truth. Of course, they report our failures in their papers very, very, I might say religiously. I don't mind to bite my tongue. Disasters. We have cases in the, in the magazine and in the, my book where I have pictures of their cosmonauts at, where there are people who have uh, been purged and subsequently airbrushed out of the group portraits, removed, uh, taken away. They never existed. I mean, it's, uh, if it's true or not, it's, it's what happens there, with their, especially in a space program. They changed the history. They can't write space history anymore, but they're very good at rewriting it. But it's, it's interesting that the first time, really in the last eight years, People in the West generally have come to the point where they now believe that these things do go on in the Soviet Union. When George Orwell wrote about such practices, which he called throwing history down the memory hole, in 1984, people took it as fantasy, uh, as a, or maybe pushing a tendency towards o- over over the edge. We now realize that practically everything in 1984 uh, was already taking was already taking place, even to the point of of the breakdown of minor technology, such as racer blades and elevators and all the rest of it. To my business, exhibit the evidence between hard covers of a book like Red Star in Orbit by my partner for the broadcast, James E. Oberg, foreword by Tom Wolfe, subtitled The Inside Story of Soviet Failures and Triumphs in Space. Tom Wolfe is with us, so is Shelley Engelmeyer, who has six books under his belt and two pictures and... They are so utterly conclusive. And these, you know, somebody's going to look at these pictures and say, well, gee whiz, how can you, you think the Soviets are dumb? 
No, this is not a sign of dumbness. Even though these are very clumsy forgeries, they're a sign of arrogance. Uh, they're just a sign of, of having total control, no back talk. Uh, and this is the way things are done. They show a group picture, and they wind up not liking somebody in that group. And the next time the picture is published, he's just not in the group picture. James Oberg explained. It's not like they cut him out from the crop in the side of the picture. This is a man, in this case, right in the middle of the back row. This is a couple, couple of cosmonauts, the second guy from the right. The next picture, there's just a rose bush there, or a shadow on the wall. And I think a lot of it might be arrogance, might also just be clumsiness. They, they, they cover things up, they, they lie about the history, but then they forget what last year's cover story was, and the picture comes out in two different books. I've, I've found, I think, about a half dozen pairs of pictures in which different, strikingly different forged versions of the same scene appear. And who knows how many other times they've done that and not made the mistake of releasing the original. Well, why would they cut a cosmonaut out of a picture? We're still working on that. The, the, there are people who suggest that these guys were killed on secret space flights. Uh, it doesn't seem likely to me. I checked those stories out, and they don't seem to be well-based. Well but it could have been someone who failed a medical test or an ideological uh, exam or was rejected from the party or was a heavy drinker or uh, got killed in a, in a car crash. What's, mo what's most interesting here is that the truth is probably not very bad. It, in the American program, we've had fatalities and medical disqualifications, and we've lived with that, and the world hasn't held it against us. But the Russians have to have such an image of perfection that rather than have the admission they had human beings in their program who are subject to human frailties, they had to cover up the man's existence entirely by forging the photograph. This happened a dozen times, uh, half a dozen times that I've found. Uh, Tom Wolf. Oh, one of the one of the scary things to me is that in some cases they get away with this for so long and on such a vast scale. And one of the most fascinating parts of Jim Oberg's book is the Netherlands disaster in which how many Jim after we think at least dozens, perhaps as many as a hundred killed, hundred people killed on a political. Uh, they were politically pressured to ignore safety. Uh, safety standards, because Khrushchev demanded this rocket be launched while he was at the UN. Uh, there's, a, there's a beautiful sketch of that in the, in the July Science Digest, showing the, the, the explosion of the rocket. Uh, I, my original suggestion is called for bodies flying through the air, but that was a little bit overdramatic. As best we can tell, the, the men were, were killed because a million pounds of kerosene and liquid oxygen spilled out over the launch pad and ignited. Uh, mm. And yet for 20 years now, that, that story has been in rumors, it's been denied and, and disbelieved, and, and over the years I've tried to gather what few threads of evidence has filtered out to the West. And I have finally become convinced that the event did happen, that uh, these, these men were killed uh, uh, one night in October 1960, because politics once again forced the abandonment of all rational safety measures. I mean, this is an enormous catastrophe, and it is just now in General Berg's book of the first time this is brought out. And, and it, you would think that you couldn't hide something that long, but they, they did it, and, and we don't know what else they've hidden, and not just in the space program. Oh, there's a lot more than a nuclear accident in uh, the year also. Uh, Georges Medvedev, uh, the, the exiled uh, doctor, brought that evidence. He was denounced uh, by many Western writers as saying that, that this couldn't have happened in Russia. And yet, uh, after several years now, I think it's conclusively proved that Medvedev was correct. There was a, a nuclear waste accident in the Urals. Medvedev also brought us very detailed accounts of this rocket disaster. Uh, and he helped very much in, in solving the puzzle. But as Tom said, uh, so much else... Uh, we, we, we find out what's happened sometimes only by accident or by a mistake in the cover-up. So what that tells us is they have many other cover-ups which probably are successful. And at the end of my book, I, I have a section where we say we don't know so much about what went on. Uh, we still need help in, in getting all these threads together to solve these puzzles. And if, the, if there are military applications here, we really can't tell what they're up to. Let's play some. If it happened to one of our reconnaissance satellites, uh, there should be some damage to it. We might, it might happen at the point where we couldn't tell it was a deliberately hostile act. It might happen somewhere over an Indian Ocean or over 
in Brazil or somewhere, and it's gone. We have a basic problem that uh, we only launch three or four reconnaissance satellites a year. They each last many, many months. The Russians are much more wasteful, perhaps. They launch 50 a year, and they only last a week. But what that means is if we have one of ours shot down, it'll be three months before the next one's ready. If the Russians have one of theirs shot down, it'll be only a week. And this is the difference in their operations. So somebody, either the Soviets or us or some third country, interfering with reconnaissance satellites is, I think, a very real possibility. To me is that uh, many of the Soviet uh, military staff are being taught the true lessons of World War II, which is not, as we might think here, don't get into a war. The lessons are, don't wait for them to hit you. Don't wait for them to hit you first. Preemptive. Uh, preemptive strikes have been big in the news the last week or so. We're hearing all kinds of justifications for some one country going and bombing other country's facilities. And in many, in many ways, uh, there's good rationalization perhaps for that. But the Soviets have always felt that that's a reasonable thing to do. That if uh, Stalin had any sense, he would have hit Hitler a couple of years before Hitler had a chance to hit him. And they, 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 they tell the people in the Soviet Union, the generals, now, what's going to happen in the West is that capitalism will collapse because it's got to, Lenin says so, and we believe it, and so forth, as the Russians say. And as it collapses, the, the, uh, the capitalists and the fascists will come out of the woods again and make a new Nazi regime and plan in one last desperate spasm to hold off the force of history, which is, of course, uh, old Marxism and Leninism, according to the Russians. They will attempt to make, make war for one last time, as Hitler did against Russia. And the Russian plan is, and they tell the East of Generals this, that when we see this is about to happen, don't wait for them to gear up and hit us. Nip it in the butt. And that's scary to me, because that's an excuse for them attacking us and claiming it was our fault. Learn Russian. I taught some myself and uh, went to and picked some college with some on the streets of Moscow. Yeah, I'm so happy to yeah, I wasn't much impressed, Barry. I heard you and Jim talking Russian over there. It seems to me you both had a slight... Uh, Ukrainian accent, you know, but, but nevertheless, it came across very well. <laughs> just not, Southern just, Ukrainian. Just not to make myself misunderstood. And I want to read Tom Wolfe's foreword, a part of it, uh, inside uh, James Oberg's book, Red Star in Orbit, the inside story of Soviet failures and triumph in space. Here's what Tom Wolfe gives us. I am particularly fond of two pictures in this book. In one, we see an official portrait of the Soviet's first group of cosmonauts taken in 1961, just after Yuri Gagarin, the one with the necktie, had become the first man to go into space. The older man in the jacket is the great Soviet rocket engineer, Sergei Korolev. In the second, we see the same scene, the same frozen slice of time, identical in every detail save one. A cosmonaut has vanished. The wall behind him has been airbrushed in, not 100% successfully, to fill up the ghostly space his mortal hide once occupied. Moreover, as we learn from James Oberg's text, our poor phantom voyager was in all likelihood dematerialized, not because of defection or scandal, but simply because he had washed out of the Soviet space program and reminders of his existence were no longer considered edifying. It is as if NASA were to have doctored its official group photographs of the seven Mercury astronauts to remove all visual trace of Deke Slayton after he developed an irregular heart rhythm and was scrubbed from the Mercury program in 1962. Of, of, of hostilities in orbit, it doesn't take that much technology anymore to throw a bucket of sand 100 miles into space in the path of an oncoming satellite. You don't need supercomputers or giant rockets to go into space and hunt down a satellite and, blow, and kill it with a blast of shrapnel. I'd say there are probably a dozen countries around the world that have the rocket technology and the guidance technology with it to, try, to try several times and over maybe a couple day period if there's a satellite they don't like coming over, overhead every, every, every day or so at 100 miles up. They can try and start doing, doing hostile things to it. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. I hope it does not happen. But again, as with a nuclear issue, many more countries are developing these technologies for mischief. Let me, at what point will there finally be so many things up there that there will be the actual chance of, of collisions? I know space is fast, but the orbits are probably that, fairly controlled. The NASA are studying that very carefully, and that uh, already, uh, of course, the, number, the chance of collisions 
is very low for big, big collisions and goes way up for very small collisions. And in fact, uh, half of the collisions, half of the little streaks and, and pits on the windows of Skylab were not meteorite particles, but were pieces of, of, of uh, rocket propellant and metal fragments off of other satellites. They were still up there. They were still up there. Most of these get cleared out because of the atmospheric drag in low Earth orbits, so it's fairly safe down close. But higher up, the set, those satellites are stable for, for thousands of years, and they'll be there until we clean them up. And first, there. Why? Well, we, we have a private group of researchers, and I say we, uh, this is a very unofficial function, not part of any uh, government agency, a club of radio amateurs who tune in to the radio signals from Soviet satellites. And by tuning in, uh, they can find out often what's going on in space hours or days or before the Russians announce it, or even in cases when the Russians never announce their flights or, or their true purposes. And this group uh, is named in honor of the, the uh, founder, who is the head of a grammar school in Kettering, England, a Kettering group. They've had many space firsts and discoveries over the years. Uh, they don't, of course, compete with uh, government intelligence agencies who have many much better resources and much better information and, but, and also cannot talk about it and that cannot tell the public for various security reasons for very uh, very good reasons so this Kettering group of people has been publishing their information on the Soviet space program for many years and is very highly regarded by, by everyone in the West in fact it's the source of information for the own for the US Library of Congress is a congressional research service the official report to our Congress on the Soviet space program bases its data on the unofficial studies of this, this Kettering group, this English school teacher and his his ten year old uh, kids who are listening to radio signals. In Sweden, there's other members of the group, and what they're doing this week is listening to a very what looks like a very momentous uh, Soviet space experiment, which involves the now empty Salyut six space station in a, a final test. Uh, which could pave the way for the next step in the Soviet program, at least permanent space station. Uh, about uh, two months ago, a few a few weeks after our Columbia space flight, the Soviets launched a satellite called Cosmos 1267, and they said this is another routine launching of a scientific satellite to explore the universe. And as usual, it was a lie. Uh, most of the time, the Cosmos satellites are military spy satellites or hunter-killer satellites or other kinds of vehicles, like the one that dropped the nuclear reactor on Canada several years ago. In this case, the Co this Cosmos satellite turned out, because of its radio signals, to be immediately recognized by the Kettering Group as a test of, a, of some kind of a man-related space system. This, this means some kind of system which cosmonauts eventually, or perhaps soon, will fly in, into, into space. It's empty now. There's nobody on board because the Soviets make these unmanned shakedown cruises to test them out. The Cosmos satellite orbit was drifting closer and closer to Salyut 6, which was subsequently abandoned by the cosmonauts and left. It's now, after four years, now being retired. But there's one more experiment to link up Cosmos 1267, which is a large spacecraft, with Salyut 6, and to make a double module space station. This experiment has been watched now for several weeks as we watch the orbits drift closer and closer together. Today, the orbits coincided. This afternoon, our tracking data from this group suggested that the 1267 had fired up its main engines on command from Earth and was now closing in for a link-up with the Salyut 6. Uh, of course, there's been no official announcement. The rush to the Russians, uh, this, is not, this doesn't exist. This experiment is not taking place. Uh, if the only news we'll read about in the next couple of days will probably come from the Kettering group. And uh, as soon as I get back to the hotel, I'm going to be checking with some other sources in England to see what the latest uh, returns are on these this tracking. Jim, you said this was momentous. Why is it so momentous? Because it's the next step. The ten years, it's been 10 years now since the Salyut class station has been used. It's a small station the size of a house trailer. You think, how can two people spend six months in a, a house trailer? Well, the Russians are used to that. I mean, look at their apartments. Uh, they, they're used to that kind of space or lack of it. But to put more people on board and to have around-the-clock operation and more bigger experiments and bigger telescopes to watch the space and watch Earth, too, watch us, uh, they need more room. If their rockets aren't big enough to put it up all at once, like our Skylab, our Skylab made their station look like a pipsqueak, so they're going to launch it in pieces. They've said they're going to do that, 
this experiment looks like the predecessor of, of the actual operational multi-modular space station. They use that phrase, modular space stations. They make no secret about it. They're going to launch one. They're going to put it up there. Pretty soon, we would be able to look into space without realizing there are Russians up there all the time, circling the Earth, crossing the U.S. five or ten times a day, and looking down and watching us. But right now, for the last few weeks in human history, in all the billions of years of, men, of life on Earth, there's no one in space, but it's going to change and change forever when the Russians build their space station, their permanent space station, in the near future. It could take as long as six months. It might, it might be the fall. It could be next spring. Is this military truly scientifically oriented? It's mostly industrially oriented, apparently. Um, they have military, military activities for the cosmonauts, uh, but their recent Soyuz 6 has not been primarily a military flight. It's been commercial development to, develop, to try and leapfrog our advances in, in computer technology, for example. They intend to use space manufacturing to try and draw ahead of us in manufacturing semi semiconductor material or, and other kinds of... Uh, and the use of space for industrial processes is something that the JASRA can tell you is very valuable, very potentially a vast market. The Soviets intend to, to get there and to use that market to pull even or surpass our industrial base. And the SAIU program is, is the... Is the, is the uh, stage, is the scene for, for this activity. We had set their station up. Uh, but there are times in the past few years when they've had men up there for six months at a time that many of our leading uh, newscasters and, and newspapers didn't even realize there were any in space. And that uh, it would be months of space flights without a mention, without a word in the American uh, newspapers. Tom, uh, what's the top Mount Everest for you right now? Uh, you have directed your attentions. I have come back down to Earth, and I have a book on mundane architecture coming out in October. It's called From Bauhaus to Our House. Uh, mundane architecture. <laughs>